Hello, and welcome to Health Affairs This Week, the podcast where health affairs editors discuss the most pressing health policy news of the week. I'm Kathleen Haddad. And I'm Jessica Bylander. This week, we're talking about the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's recently announced plans to revamp how the CDC does its work and engages with the public. Jess, what are we hearing? Yeah, so last week, Dr. Rochelle Wilinski, who became director of the CDC um, in January 2021, announced that she's making some changes at the agency. Um, And this doesn't come as a big surprise. She mentioned earlier in her tenure that she'd be looking into how the CDC has handled particularly the COVID-19 pandemic, and she launched a month-long review and evaluation of the CDC in April of this year. So the review is complete. It's not been made public, um, but based on what we know from news reports, which seem to be reporting on a video that Walensky sent to CDC employees last week, Um, She does plan to learn from the past failings and revamp how CDC operates in a few ways. So according to the news reports, the key goals are to refocus the CDC on public health needs, to respond faster to emergencies and disease outbreaks, and to provide more accessible information for the public and also for state and local health authorities. How exactly, Jess, does she propose to do that? Yeah, so one thing she's proposing is to get CDC data out into the open more quickly. Um, So previously, the um, main way of communicating CDC data was through periodically published scientific papers. Namely, those are coming out in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and that's peer-reviewed. It takes some time to reach readers, um, and the readers are often academics as well as, you know, journalists and the public to some extent, but kind of geared toward academics. So as part of the revamp, plans would be to collect and analyze data in a more streamlined way and to provide it more quickly, potentially before the peer review process was complete. Um, And she says this wouldn't replace the peer review process, but would supplement it. And then another key goal is to just provide this information and data in plain language, quote unquote, that's easy for everyone to understand. Um, And so that's apparently a change that's already starting to be implemented. Um, When the CDC released its most recent isolation guidance earlier this month, which among other things recommended masking instead of quarantine if you're exposed to COVID-19, they're meant to be written in a way that's more accessible and practical and hopefully less confusing. Um, So those are kind of the two main things that seem to be coming out of this this announcement. Um, So, you know, Kathleen, how did we get here? And can you say more about why this was seen as necessary in the first place? Well, that's a good question, Jess. Um, I think it's helpful to back up a little bit and and um, recall what the original purpose of the CDC was. It was structured originally as a, a hub of federal consultants and specialists in communicable disease, and they had field agents. They would be stationed in the state and local health departments. Not that long ago, several decades ago, there was this sense that the uh, problems we have with chronic or infectious diseases, we we thought they were conquered. And so um, CDC began to broaden its focus on uh, chronic diseases and injury prevention and uh, health equity, very important goals, um, but not goals that have an emergency nature, a characteristic about them. So when the last pandemic hit, the COVID pandemic, um, the CDC uh, had problems collecting data and uh, case counts, hospitalizations, mortality, and the demographics that go along with those counts. Because some state health and health departments, state and local health departments didn't provide the data. And, and there was no process in place for the data to flow automatically. There was also the well-known problem with the test kits not, um, not getting out. And so, um, hence the criticism. So, Jess, what are folks saying? Is this criticism fair? And how are folks reacting to these uh, changes that Dr. Walensky is proposing? Yeah, I would say even the CDC is kind of acknowledging that some of the criticism is fair. They're owning up to some of their failings, you know, the faulty test kits initially, um, you know, not having the data out there. I I remember, you know, um, Hopkins Data Hub kind of became 
became the definitive data source for for most reporting and most um, discussions because it was you know it was available quickly. Um, so owning up to those failings for sure and identifying ways they could have handled things differently. Um, but at the same time, I think it's worth noting that this felt somewhat unprecedented in the degree to which COVID-19 and the public health precautions against it became politicized. So, you know, there was debate about whether Americans should be asked to mask early on. And so on the one hand, science was saying that it would um, reduce transmission, but at the same time, you know, trying to weigh um, how the public would receive that message and how it would be received um, by the White House. So there was definitely times in which the CDC seemed at odds with the White House, which didn't help with the issues of public confusion and public trust. So amidst the missteps of the agency itself, this loss of trust seemed to come also from the fact that the disease became really political. And, you know, in addition to that, um, you know, public health in general is underfunded and lacks the necessary workforce. So those are those are problems that the announced changes won't necessarily address. And in terms of how this news is being received, some are definitely applauding the steps and saying that they will help in some ways, particularly the focus on direct communication with the public. Um, but others are saying the steps won't go far enough. And I know we published a piece in Forefront in June that called for much broader changes to CDC's mission and work. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, Jess, uh, this piece in Forefront by Brian Miller and colleagues said that CDC needs to go back to its core mission um, and not totally forgo some of the other important tasks regarding um, chronic disease and injury prevention and health equity, but but put this focus right back on the public health service's core job of shoe leather epidemiology and be ready for the next pandemic. And that means uh, getting into state and local health departments with partnerships that are lasting. They need to set up, according to Miller, uh, better data flow and contracts with technology firms to make that happen. He says the the CDC needs to refocus its workforce or re- kind of reconstitute its workforce. Right now, 5% of the CDC workforce is the Commission to Public Health Service Corps. Those are the folks in uniform. Um, and they, But they often now do the same job as civil servants, which comprise 50% of the CDC workforce or more. And then there are contractors, uh, 40% of contractors. Miller says that the civil servants need to be eligible to move into the public health service commissioned corps, do those uh, jobs that focus on making us more prepared for pandemics, and public health service corps numbers need to increase. The advantage of the PHS is that CDC can send them where they need to go. They have, a, I guess, more control, you would say, over this workforce. And that's good for the American public when there is a pandemic that needs addressing. Also, um, Miller made a point of uh, emphasizing how the relationships need to be strengthened with the state and local health departments um, as well. Um, a problem with that is that there are some counties that don't even have health departments. And so um, there's a huge investment uh, needed in um, uh, shoring up those services on the local level, because that's really where communicable disease is really uh, addressed in the first responder state. Yeah, I thought that article was was really interesting. I definitely wondered, you know, how that would be received, asking the CDC to do less than it currently does um, in order to re- refocus on communicable diseases. And kind of wondered who would come in to fill the gap that was left behind. And, um, you know, we published actually kind of a reaction to that piece also in Forefront in July by Ron Valdeseri, who's a former CDC official. Um, And he talks about, you know, modernizing CDC is um, all good and well, but there definitely needs to be um, a complementary investment as you mentioned, in the state, local, tribal departments of health and their workforces, and that, you know, basically it's it's not CDC alone handling these things. So, um, so we can reform CDC, but if we're not kind of reforming the public health system at large, which is very complex and has a lot of moving parts, 
we're going to continue to see these sort of failings when um, public health emergencies like COVID-19 and monkeypox come about. Um, so kind of offering a different take and definitely, as you mentioned, highlighting the importance of those state and local health departments, as well as other sectors beyond healthcare, including housing, employment, and other um, social sectors. Yeah, you know, Jess, it's interesting. Um, way, way back, I remember the American uh, Public Health Association published a report that foreshadowed this problem with um, state and local public health uh, officials, a depletion of, of the workforces there. Um, and it said and a huge investment was needed many decades ago to um, help us deal with the uh, communicable diseases that would be upcoming. And that was many decades ago. So our presumption that some of these problems were solved with infectious disease might have been a little uh, too soon. Yeah, especially with even news of a new polio case. Hopefully, you know, attention is being paid to this and COVID-19 obviously um, heightened the attention on the need to to strengthen the public health workforce. So just one of the preeminent leaders of our public health workforce made an announcement this week. Tell us about that. That's right. Anthony Fauci, who became a, kind of a celebrity during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, announced he'll be stepping down as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical advisor to President Joe Biden. Um, and that will go into effect in December as he moves on to do different things. And he's been doing his job for decades and um, is, is renowned for his work on HIV AIDS and other um, pandemics in addition to COVID-19. Well, Jess, that sounds like a good place to wrap up, right? Right. Um, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Health Affairs this week. If you like this episode, tell a friend, leave a review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Jess.